Welcome to more World of Warplanes content from the Noble Q, and in this video I'm going to take a close look at the Tier 8 Tech Tree American Heavy Fighter, the Chance Fort XF-5U Pancake. Hello there, and here we have the XF-5U on the tarmac outside my hangar, and this was a, an aircraft intended for the US Navy. It made it as far as prototype stage, uh, but Coming as it did at the uh, very start of the jet engine age, it was cancelled in 1947, never made it into operational service. And in fact, it's interesting, it's called the Pancake in this game, but that uh, nickname actually be belonged to an earlier prototype, the V173, also built by Vought or Chance Vought if you prefer. As far as I know, this one was actually called the Flying Flapjack, but as I say, in this game it's the Pancake and that's how it shall be known. You can see the tiny tins there, we'll talk about those in a bit. In this air, uh, game it's classified as a heavy fighter. Mm. Well it's not an air superiority fighter and we'll begin to see that when we look at the numbers and how I've set the aircraft up. So we're going to look at the numbers next. If you don't want to look at a spreadsheet, use the links below the video to skip ahead to another part of it. Here's the spreadsheet for all of the tier 8 heavies. There are 8 of them as you can see. And I'm going to take a moment to explain how this spreadsheet works. If you know, know that already, then skip ahead to the part where I discussed the statistics. So the XF5U is in columns C and D, as you can see, and then each of the other heavies has its own two columns. So the P28B twin Mustang is in E and F, the other twin Mustang is in G and H, and so on. Down the left, we have the information you can see in the hangar UI. With respect to the gun armament, it's been supplemented by information from a third party website for auto aim angle, dispersion angle and overheat time. The statistics for all the aircraft, and I hope you can see me circling this, are in this table here. And as far as colour coding is concerned, green denotes a best in class figure, light blue, second best in class, light purple, a third best in class. And then a gold colour behind the name of the aircraft indicates that it's a premium or a reward aircraft. And then I reverse the logic using red colours for worst in class figures. For the purposes of the, of the comparison, configuration was stock in every case, ordnance where available was mounted, equipment was removed, pilot was sent back to the barracks, and the modules were all top. Let's start by looking at the gun armament. And the rating is 38, the DPS 618. And this is in the middle of the bunch um, of the tier 8 heavies. However, there are some very hard hitting aircraft, the P1056, the ME262, the Chain Lightning in this comparison. And a rating of 38 is similar to that of the P28B twin Mustang. Now, I don't hear anybody complaining about the twin Mustang being short of firepower. Well, not this one anyway. That said, with an overheat time of just four seconds on these cannons, you have to be careful. They're pretty good guns especially if you set them up really carefully, and I'll explain how I've done that later. Um, but if you're not careful with them, you will struggle. Dispersion angle is 0.5, which is so-so for cannons. It's not bad, it's not good. Auto-time angle, it, which is the dis distance by how much you can be off target before the game corrects your aim, um, is only two degrees, which is a little bit miserly, but it could be worse. Range is fairly decent at 2362, rate of fire 700, and DPS 170 per gun. Practically, if I'm careful with these guns, I find them pretty good. When it comes to ordnance, your top module are rockets, Tiny Tims, as you saw in the first impression section. And I like these. There are people who think miss the bombs when they get all of the top modules, having specialised the aircraft. I'm not one of them. You can reliably take out two gun emplacements with these, and the reload is quick enough to make it uh, possible to take out several gun emplacements in a game if that's what you want to do. That said, it's not going to be concentrating on ground attacking in the way that both of the twin Mustangs can. Yeah... And possibly it's not as good as the um, Dornier 335A1 file either, which can take out four gun emplacements uh, and then reload fairly quickly in a game. Survivability uh, is second best in class. It was a robust aircraft. Allegedly, when it came to the time to scrap the prototype of this aircraft, a wrecking ball had to be used. And that's reflected here. 
fire resistance figures are best in class, damage resistance figures are best in class, and the hit points, as you can see, are second best in class. So it's quite rugged. Airspeed, well, the heavies are fairly much of a muchness. The ME262 is pretty quick, but all of the rest of the aircraft all lie within about five rating points of one another. Um, however, there's something that's hidden here on the best in class figures, so I'll just drop down to the worst in class figures uh, uh, here. You want to watch out for your boost duration. Manage it carefully, it's the worst in class, it's only 20 seconds. And the dive speed is not very good either for a heavy. Don't dive away from other heavies, that's not your escape method. We come to maneuverability. Now, the pancake um, back in 2018 was um, an overpowered aircraft and it received a fairly big nerf. And if you want to know about that nerf, I've put a link to that in the video description below read uh, uh, up about what was done to the aircraft. Until the advent of the twin Mustangs, however, this aircraft was as manoeuvrable as any of the other heavies, and it wasn't unusual for it to be built with manoeuvrability, and that manoeuvrability would be used against other heavies. Now, given the presence of the twin Mustangs, you need to be a bit careful about using that approach and change it if these are in the game uh, on the enemy team. However, there are some interesting figures here. And it's all about how slowly this aircraft can fly. And that's not something you commonly hear. However, this stall speed is an impressive 50 miles an hour. Not only can you make heavies fly past you, and then you can hit them with the guns, you can make almost anything fly past you, and you can hit them with the guns. And that includes light fighters. This is an interesting mechanic, and it is worth experimenting with. If you're in trouble, slam the brakes on and see if you can get your opponent to fly past you. You may very well find that you turn the tables on him with this. And when we come to altitude performance, it's not a particularly high flying aircraft, but what it does have going for it is a best in class climb rate. And there's your escape method from other heavies. If you're quick about it, and in particularly if you improve this figure, which you can with the right choice of equipment, you can often escape from other heavies by basically flying straight upwards. We just take a quick look at the worst in class figures and see if there's anything else we can glean from this. I'm not going to worry too much about the fact that this third worst in class armament, it's good enough if you are careful with it and you set it up correctly. I've already adverted to the maximum dive speed. I'll just draw your attention to it again to ram home the points. The aircraft is not particularly fast in terms of its maximum optimum speed. Probably you're not going to really notice that in a game. You'll be too busy flying around and turning and weaving and ducking and diving to really pay attention to your speed unless you can do it in a way that I can't. And the altitude performance, I did say it's certainly uh, not particularly good compared to the other heavies. You can see that um, it's definitely at the lower end of the scale in terms of its a maximum optimum altitude and its service ceiling. But you're not going to really worry about too much um, that too much uh, with the pancake anyway. This is not an air superiority heavy. In fact, if anything, this is almost a hybrid of a heavy and a multi-role and indeed to some degree, especially with that low speed there being a, meaning that it can mix it with light fighters, it's also a bit of a light fighter. So try and fly this in a way that you might fly your multi-rolls and your fighters when you get the opportunity. Try and use the ordnance to a good effect to flip sectors. Don't try and fly this as a true air superiority heavy. That's not the way to uh, succeed in this plane. Now we're going to take a look at how I've set my uh, pancake up. And this aircraft is specialised, which means I have all of the equipment and consumable slots available to me. This is what you'd be missing when you uh, have this aircraft in stock configuration, and it's quite a lot because, of course, it's a Tetri aircraft. Um, of five equipment slots, one will be missing off the airframe and one will be missing off the engine. And then of the consumables, you'll be missing one slot off the engine. Let's go and see put this back into specialist configuration and let's talk about what I've actually done. Let's start with the cockpit slot of course and unsurprisingly I've chosen to mount a gun sight. Um, cockpit armour I don't think is particularly useful on this aircraft, it's fairly rugged anyway. You do have the option of the G-suit, 
the effects of which are somewhat uncertain because as far as I know they're not published anywhere but when you're flying at high speeds this increases the maneuverability of the aircraft I don't think this is for the pancake personally and the navigational radio equipment increased visibility and decreased range at which you're detected again you are going to be mixing it with other aircraft you're going to be seen um, you're not going to have any trouble finding your next target I don't think this is the right choice either no surprises then, it's the gun sight. So if we take a look at what we've done with it in terms of the bonus characteristics, these aren't the bonus characteristics I would choose today. These are the ones I set up in 2018. I would keep the 5% accuracy uh, when firing at moving targets. There's another one just below it, uh, for another 3%, which I'd also pick off. I dropped the chance of inflicting critical damage. I may keep the chance of causing a fire, I like that. Alternatively, you might want to choose the uh, extra resistance um, to injury um, for your pilot. I have a first aid kit mounted so I would prefer to keep the uh, chance of causing a fire. Moving on and here we begin to see that in the airframe slot and one of the engine slots I have a maneuverability build. So we have the lightweight wing frame here. Uh, your choice air our alternatives are reinforced skin and reinforced airframe. It's already a rugged aircraft. Uh, polished skin for extra speed. Well it's not the fastest aircraft and I don't really see the point in improving the speed when you're going to be engage, engaging in quite a few near dog fights I would say where your slowness is your advantage not your speed so it's the lightweight wing frame for me if we look at the bonus characteristics we've got here nowadays again I set this back up in 2018 I would pick off the roll maneuverability that I already have and almost certainly I'd pick off the bottom two characteristics there the your maneuverability and the roll maneuverability which I haven't picked off um, so far we have a lightweight power unit um, in the first of the engine slots again your choices are engine armor protection already a pretty rugged aircraft said that um, several times already already um, you've also got the uprated engine which I've currently got mounted, we'll talk about that in a minute. The other uh, alternative is a combined injection boost system. You might choose that instead of this lightweight power unit. Um, but again, I want to try and maximise the manoeuvrability of this aircraft, so I'm going to keep the lightweight power unit on for certain. And we'll look at the bonus characteristics for this. It's interesting. I might pick off the two extra 2% two your manoeuvrability. If I'm not going to do that, then I'm certainly going to probably pick off more cruise speed, which I have 1%, but there's also a half percent there. Um, or I may just keep it as it is, so I've got the two acceleration figures. Um, the last choice is uh, resistance to critical damage for the engine. Not my favourite choice. Now it gets interesting here. Currently I've got the uprated engine and... If we just look at the bonus characteristics at the moment, we'll see that I've got uh, speed, um, acceleration, and engine cooldown rate selected. Um, and I'm not sure I would actually change any of those, apart from possibly picking off the resistance to fire, but the resistance is already really good. Um, and I think I can actually afford to take the uprated engine, even though it impacts the resistance to fire. That's a a negative characteristic as you can see there in red I can still feel comfortable enough to take a first aid kit and not a fire extinguisher however I don't think if I was setting this aircraft up again that this is the piece of equipment that I would choose and the reason being is your altitude performance particularly your rate of climb now the base rate of climb I mentioned was 465 feet per second it's already 480 here and if I'm seeking to use the rate of climb as an escape method probably I want to improve that even more and the way to do that would be to actually mount the combined injection boost system now I only have an improved level combined injection uh, height sorry high speed gas turbine I should be saying here Yeah, to mount so but let's just quickly pop it on and already even though this is only at proof level there are two further levels advanced and ultimate level and of course calibration to come on top of this the altitude performance is improved here by a, another 11 feet per second so you can see that you're going to get a fairly big improvement once this, this piece of equipment is taken up two levels and then fully calibrated and I would almost certainly do that it would also improve your boost speed 
Here we can see it's already 10 and there will be more to come, so you could fly pretty quickly. Unfortunately, will it impact your cruise speed? Well, I've already said uh, that you will look to be flying fairly slowly in this aircraft at times. Is that much of a problem? I'll leave it to you to judge. I don't think it is, personally. The other problem will be is that your boost duration will be taken down a little bit, but there are bonus characteristics you can use um, to offset this. Currently it drops by two. Once this is taken up to ultimate level and calibrated a bit, that could drop by three, but then you can use a bonus characteristic to probably get it back to minus two. And this is the piece of equipment that if I had an ultimate level uh, high-speed gas turbine, I would choose today. However, I didn't. Um, we're going to reset it for the moment until I, the day that I can improve that piece of equipment. Not that I fly the pancake very much these days. And this is the setup that I used in the forthcoming battles that you're going to see. Okay, consumables. With the high resistance to fire um, this aircraft has, even though I have an uprated engine, I've still mounted a first aid kit. And that will help me heal the pilot if he's shot out by a tail gunner. Uh, and allow me to keep pumping my bullets into the target uh, accurately. Emergency control system, I'm going to drop that. This is the piece of equipment, I would, uh, consumable, that I would use these days in this slot. That's the pneumatic control assist. If you have any boost at all, engine cooling will add 10 seconds to it. You've probably begun to see that I almost always mount my engine cooling on any sort of fighter. If you want to go a little bit faster, your alternative here is the improved mixture control, and that wouldn't be a bad choice. Um, flying slowly is not necessarily bad for this aircraft, but if you're trying to fly away from a heavy and you get your engine shot out, you will miss the restart bottle, and that's why I've mounted it. Finally, when it comes to uh, ammunition, I mount universal ammunition. Okay, let's turn our attention to pilot skills. And as I begin to think about pilot skills, I've just had a thought. Uh, let's... Uh, divert just for a second. What we're going to do is we're going to pick off a combined injection boost system, cannibalize it from another aircraft temporarily. I've got one rated at 416 here. We'll just pop that on. Now I'm not going to commit to this because it will cost me six tokens and deprive the other aircraft, whatever it is, of its high-speed gas turbine. But if we just look at the rate of climb we can see it's gone up by 28 to 508 now from a base figure of 465 and this is rated at 416 so there's more to come you can get this piece of equipment up to 478 I'm going to guess that's going to get somewhere around the region of 520 feet per second and if we look at the airspeed we'll see that uh, we've now got a significantly faster aircraft under boost so if you're trying to climb away from a heavy that's helpful you're still only losing the 20 miles an hour um, off the cruise speed um, Okay, so that's that diversion. You've now seen what an ultimate level piece of equipment um, can do to those figures over, over there on the right. Let's reset before I accidentally commit to that and cost myself six tokens and then spend an age trying to find the aircraft I lost the uh, combined injection boost system off. And now we'll talk pilot skills. This is not a crew trainer, it's not a premium aircraft, so you have an, a pilot whose proficiency is for this aircraft. If you move him elsewhere, unless it's into a premium, that will uh, come at a penalty. If you put another pilot in here, he will not be able to control this aircraft as well as this one. And I'd start straight away, assuming you have pieces of equipment mounted, lightweight uh, air, airframe, lightweight power units, uh, or the speed equipments, uprated engine, combined injection boost system, this skill improves those by 40%. This is the first skill I'd pick off for two points. And then it would be a, um, a question of working on this block here, Picking off Engine Guru 1, Marksman 1, not in that order, the other way around, Marksman 1 first, and then Marksman 2 before Engine Guru 2. And you, as you can see, I've already got these. I used to fly this aircraft a fair bit back in 2018 and worked my way up. After that, I'd pick off Acrobatics ex uh, Aerobatics Expert to improve the maneuverability a bit more, and then I'd start working towards resilience. But that's a long way in the future. Okay, that's pilot skills. Let's see how this aircraft performs in battle. The map for the forthcoming battle is Plateau. It's the surprise attack variant with five sectors laid out roughly in the shape of five spots of the die. Uh, I, my apologies, this is one of these replays where the central symbols for the sectors appear to be missing. But what we have is a central garrison. Not strategically important because it only conveys the standard three resources every five seconds, but tactically pretty important because it uh, provides easy access to all of the other sectors. 
and then on one axis about uh, the garrison, we have what I think are the just about the most important uh, uh, sectors strategically, a pair of mining plants, one near each spawn. And then on the other axis, similarly, we have nearly as important as the mining plants, we, command centers, these release bomber flights to attack an enemy sectors. And again, we have one near each spawn. Now, you may think that the way to win this battle is to try and hold your local command center in the mining plant and then the garrison in the middle at minimum so that you can easily attack the enemy's mining plant at command center. Practically, what tends to happen is that each team gets one side of the map, so they tend to do something like take their local mining plant and then the enemy uh, command center and the enemy takes their local mining plant and your uh, command center. Um, and then it becomes a question of who can most easily try and seize back control of their local resource that they've lost to the enemy. It can be that kind of lopsided battle. Whichever, you end up trying to hold at least two sectors, either these two or these two, if you're the red spawn here, and the garrison to allow you to try and get hold, at least for some period of time, the enemy sectors. If we look at the order of battle, we can see that I'm top tier in my pancake. And I have a tier 7 BF 109G for company. The enemy has two tier 8s, a Junkers 288C and a Spitfire 14. Okay, well the bomber on a two plant map, I think in terms purely of planes, gives the enemy an advantage. But let's see how this battle played out. What I didn't mention in the strategy and tactics section is that there are in fact two spawns per side on this uh, map, one near the command centre and one near the mining plant. I'm nearest the command centre and I've got a couple of tiny Tims, which as I've said earlier in the video are excellent at taking out gun emplacements. So I could go there. Alternatively, I could try and intercept what I assume will be the bomber uh, at uh, the enemy's mining plant and that's what I've decided to do on this occasion. Now this is a high risk strategy, the safe option is to make sure of the command centre and then assess what needs to be done with respect to perhaps the garrison, this mining plant that I'm approaching now, or even one's own mining plant. I begin to weave to try and avoid uh, anti-aircraft fire, I see a heavy up above, I see bombers below and a multi-roll. And immediately I decide to engage in a dogfight with the multi-roll. Go up using the climb speed and then use a gravity assisted turn. And as you can see, given that the multi-roll is a relatively immobile P47, I'm not doing too badly against it despite the fact that this is meant to be a heavy. Now we climb here using the excellent climb rate. Wait until we've got some distance between me and the target. And then come back down on it. This one turns out to be a Tempest, and you saw that the guns are pretty good at taking out uh, low hit point aircraft, and there goes the P-47B as well. I should just mention this is a regular World of Warplanes replay file. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get a native recording of this one, so my apologies if you're finding the reticle being a little bit off target uh, frustrating. So do I. The bonus battle that's coming up, that is a native recording. And now we're sizing up another multi-roll, a Focke Wolf. Trying to be fairly careful with the guns, remember that short overheat time. And down goes that multi-roll. Now we've got our garrison, I've uh, got THE garrison I should say in the centre. It's slightly surprising to me, but we haven't taken our command centre, nor have we taken our plant. So now it's becoming critical that I don't let the enemy get this if I can possibly avoid it. Now we're sizing up our first bomber. The AA sizes me up, forgot to weave enough. And then I have to disengage because there's a multi roll, another Focke Wolf, and indeed a th Tempest as well. There's a lot of enemy aircraft here. I managed to get back on the bomber, but I realise I can't sit on him any longer. I lose my engine, put it back in. Fire at the Focke Wolf. Decide to fly away. Now I've accidentally fired off one of my tiny Tims with my fat fingers, which is a bit of a shame. Turn back on the Focke Wolf and destroy him. 
There's another Fokker Wolf. I don't know where the Tempest went. And we've got our plant, but the enemy now has the central garrison and it also has its command center. Fire off the Tiny Tim. That takes out the gun emplacement. Go to fire off my second Tiny Tim and, and realize I haven't got it. And now we're on a grand attacker. Fly up. Better to shoot grand attackers from above. I always feel that they're less well protected from above. And as I try to do that, there, the Tempest suddenly appears from nowhere. But I destroy him with the guns and I'm able to kill the grand attacker as well. Unfortunately, I've lost my engine and this time I can't repair for another 20 seconds. So I'm a sitting duck here. And there's a multi rock coming in. Again, a Focke Wolf. Fortunately, the power of my guns deters him from staying in a head on with me. I think if I'd been a human player in the Focke Wolf, I probably would have stayed on the pancake. That allows me to shoot that one down. The engine's coming back in. And I haven't actually shot down a bomber yet. Just pop the figures back in. They've been missing for a while. You can see I've shot down seven aircraft, seven multi rolls, and that's the first bomber here. Took a lot of damage from that. But we now have the plant. That was a hard fight, but my high risk strategy has reaped rewards. Take on the Focke Wolf again. Cheeky turn because it's a bot. Paid for that. Fly away and then I see the Tempest coming into range. Short bursts. Not very effective ones on this occasion. Now we're beginning to damage the Tempest. And down he goes. You see this aircraft is pretty lethal against aircraft with low hit points such as multi rolls. It would be as against fighters as well of course. But it's not too shabby at taking down bombers and uh, grand attackers either. And here's another grand attacker. Overheat there. But I've got a pretty good cooldown rate. Here I've lost my pilot. Oh, I'm on one hit point. I'm going to go down here. But I do manage to get that multi-roll before I go down. I choose to spawn near our command centre. And then perversely fly towards our plant or the centre. And that was because as I spawned, I was going to attack the aircraft at the command centre. But I can see the bomber, and I guessed it might be the human bomber, but it's not. It's the bot TU2, to, to nevertheless. It's part of my role to take out low-flying bombers for sure, so here we are. And that's when I spot the human bomber. Deal with the TU2, swing round back towards what I assume will be the human bomber approaching me. From very low health, so it should be an easy kill. And so it is. And we lost our local plant, but we've had so possession of so many sectors for so long, we've got a very healthy lead here. I think it may be time for another multi roll. There it goes. That's my tenth of the game. Tenth multi roll. Fourteenth aircraft. And now we're looking for targets. Grand Attacker affords more hit points than the Heavy, plus more experience. In theory, this one's almost dead, so it's just a kill, and that's the Hero of the Sky Badge. And just before the end of the game, we're flying back to protect this plant. Find another Grand Attacker. Ah, sadly, 
one of my t bot multi rolls finishes it off, and then as I swing for the multi roll, that gets finished off as well. Nonetheless, highly successful game, high risk strategy paid dividends there, and we have a ho host of medals and 19,000 personal points. Let's take a look at the outcome of this battle, and as we can see from the center, it's a 5 chevron battle, or a grade 1 heavy fighter, that grossed 113,932 credits, of which um, nearly 38,000 came from a premium account bonus. If we look in the message box, we can see that there were expenses of 9,400 credits for losing the aircraft once, that's repair costs, I was using prepaid consumables, so no expenses there. 8,386 experience, the base there was 3,289, premium account bonus 1,600 or thereabouts, and then liveries and the like uh, provided the rest of the bonus. 419 free experience, first win of the day, uh, 337 um, base, 82 for premium account. No tokens, but there are a couple, three in fact, uh, epic achievements here with the Maguire's Medal, Winged Legend and Hero of the Sky. On the personal score tab, we can see that two of the three com um, class-specific missions are complete. The last one, attack aircraft and bombers, um, three-fifths complete. That's the bare minimum uh, for a five chevron battle. Just made it. Lucky I took that uh, attack aircraft right at the end there. 19,120 um, personal points, one sector captured, that hard fight for the mining plant. Uh, aerial targets, 15 destroyed, 7,911 damage to aerial targets, a critical damage of 26. Lost the aircraft once, as I've already mentioned. Uh, capture points, 580, and that was divided into 200 for defending, and unsurprisingly, the majority, 380 for attacking. Uh, one tar ground target destroyed, obviously missed uh, one of the gun emplacements, that's naughty, uh, for 2,210 damage. Look at the team score tab, we can see that was the enough for first place both by chevrons and personal points and uh, the BF109G down tiered in a difficult aircraft no disrespect there um, good effort from the Spitfire tier 8 here 14,405 bit unlucky to lose the battle I should think he thinks and the human bomber um, could have probably done a little bit better although I did stop him once nice battle to win And that concludes my look at the Transport XF5U Pancake, which isn't an air superiority heavy, so I've built it for manoeuvrability. I've carefully built the guns, and I managed them as just as carefully in battle to get the most out of them. I use the excellent climb rate as an escape method, and the tiny tims are always useful for flipping sectors. Well, I hope you found that useful, and that if you did, you'll come and see my future content. And although I'm going to leave the video at this point, stick around, there's an bonus feature, an unnarrated battle coming up, which I hope you'll enjoy. But until the next time, this is the Noble Q signing out. You are approaching the area of combat operations. Be ready. Let's roll.